Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, so uh, you're very welcome to tonight's event. For those who don't know me, I'm Rob Barton, and I'm the acting director of the Institute of Advanced Study. I'm delighted to say our permanent director, Veronica Strang, is here also, and we're going to hear um, shortly about uh, a book launch that she's going to be doing after uh, this event. So I'd, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's great to see such a, a good turnout. Um, and uh, thanks to all our alumni for continuing to support the IAS. We really value that very much. Thanks also to Michael Itzer and the ICAEW for um, providing this venue for us uh, uh, and hosting our event tonight. I think you'll agree it's a really great venue. So I'm just going to say a, a, a few brief words and then hand over to uh, the chair for tonight who's going to introduce the speakers. Um, and what I really wanted to say was um, something a, a, about change and the role of the IAS. Because they say that change is really the only constant thing in life. Um, and it does seem, though, that uh, change is happening in some respects. It's happening uh, at an unprecedented rate at the moment, certainly for higher education and the university sector um, in the UK. Uh, and that's in terms of our global context and particularly our European context is providing and, and is set to provide some very real challenges to universities. Um, within the UK, um, there are changes in the higher education sector driven to some extent uh, by politics. Within Durham University, we're busy implementing a, a new strategy uh, over the next 10 years. And in the, the IAS, we're changing as well. Um, so we're moving from, uh, uh, you, some of you may know that uh, until now, um, we've had a kind of a model where uh, we have an annual theme, an overarching umbrella theme within which we have activities. Uh, and from this year onwards, um, from the next academic year onwards, we're moving to a new framework where we support um, high quality projects proposed by uh, our own academics. Um, and so this is the last year when we're having an overarching theme, the theme this year uh, being structure. Um, but we're very excited about the new model. Um, there are some uh, incredibly exciting interdisciplinary projects that are going to be happening from next year onwards. And um, for more information about that and those projects and everything that the IAS is doing, do, do go and look at our website and see what we're up to. And do please uh, keep in touch with us. What does... Uh, remain unchanging, though, is uh, the need to respond to change uh, and to solve uh, problems that the world uh, throws up at us. And at the IAS, our approach is that um, this really demands bringing different perspectives together. Uh, and that's our mission, essentially, is to bring ideas together. Uh, to provide sort of fertile interdisciplinary ground to germinate new thinking that will help us to solve today's and tomorrow's problems. Tonight, um, as we're going to hear, we have a, a fine uh, set of panellists bringing quite different uh, dif disciplinary perspectives to uh, the issue of quality of life. What does that mean? Uh, how do we address it? And how do we enhance it? Um, and we have uh, a fine chair who I'm now uh, going to introduce to you and, and hand over to. Uh, Sam Hilliard, my colleague, who's a co-director at the Institute of Advanced Study. Um, she's a sociologist, but that doesn't adequately capture um, her thinking and all the things that she does. She's uh, a most interdisciplinary sociologist, and uh, she's a great colleague. And I, I know that she's going to be a fantastic chair tonight. Uh, and so I'm going to leave it to Sam to take over from here and tell us about uh, what we have in store for us and uh, to introduce our panelists. <laughs> So thank you for coming, and over to you, Sam. Uh, many thanks, Sam. Um... Uh, many thanks to, to my colleague uh, Rob and uh, uh, to echo his, his warm welcome uh, to you all. Um, I'm really utterly delighted uh, to, to present this panel of, of experts to you to discuss uh, the theme of, of quality of life. So, um, and as to echo Rob, Rob's point earlier, um, I hope you will join us to have a, a bit of a conversation with uh, the people who've authored a book that has come out of uh, Institute collaborations. That will be later on um, at the drinks reception. Um, so the format of what I want to do um, this evening 
um, is to very briefly just talk to you um, about each of our speakers in terms of their disciplines, and then ask <coughs> them to give a little bit of a flavor of, to their thinking um, on quality of life, and then to allow a, a conversation uh, to emerge from that. Are there common themes? Are there, there clashes or disparate things to tease out some of the, the thinking there? Um, but also, something I do want to, to flag is that I'd like to, to call on your collective uh, brain power uh, later on in the evening and to throw the, uh, uh, the it, to have questions from the floor um, to, to see if you have any particular things you want to follow up on or, or perhaps ask um, it, about in a little bit more detail. So um, I'll, I'll start um, at this end, I think. Uh, Professor David Hunter, who join, uh, joins us from Newcastle um, University, um, is an incredible portfolio of work over 40 years on, on health policy um, and incredibly knowledgeable about the changes that have taken place uh, with their own, within our own system and also um, some best practice examples globally as well. So I, I, I have an inkling what David's going to be talking about later and I, I think he'll be really interested to, to hear what he has to say. To his um, right is uh, Professor Kimberly uh, Brownlee um, from Warwick University. Uh, she's a philosopher, and I think she's going to bring something distincting about how we engage with um, and expect something or should expect something back in our in everyday interpersonal kind of relationships. Um, I'm not going to say any more because I think Kimberly can put it much more eloquently uh, than I can. Uh, to her right is Professor uh, Brett Smith, um, who joins us um, uh, from Birmingham University. Um, Brett's a, a strong empirical scholar, but is focused on, on health and exercise science um, and used a variety of empirical uh, explorations of that to, to think about quality of life and how that changes in, for example, after sporting injuries. And I know he'll be appealing to some of his extensive empirical projects in that, in that field to talk through some of his thinking and reflections, quite theoretically informed as well, um, about some of his ideas on that as well. To Brett's right um, is uh, our former chancellor um, at Durham University, uh, Bill Bryson, um, who I'm delighted who's been able to, to join us, has obviously had a long relationship um, with the university, um, and he's written on practically everything, it seems to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he's going to have a lovely purview that will help pull the, the conversation together, um, and I think he has a, a lot to offer. So I'm going to ask each of our speakers just to, to, to say, in the order I've introduced them, uh, just to say uh, one or two, two words, and then we'll take the, the, the conversation from there. So um, welcome, and I'm delighted to hand over to, to, to David. Thank you, Sam. Well, good evening, everyone, and it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I spent 17 years at Durham, so it's nice to reconnect with Durham, even though I'm at Newcastle now. Um, I'm first to pitch. It'll be more than one or two words, but it won't be um, a huge number. Um, we've been given roughly five minutes each, I think, to, to set our stall out. Uh, this is a hugely complex, multifaceted topic. Uh, either would be sufficient on their own to discuss structure or quality of life, but to put them together uh, means that uh, one is really in the midst of immense complexity. So uh, I'm going to be very reductionist in taking a particular stance and a particular theme uh, to focus on. And uh, it plays to what I hope are my strengths in uh, health policy um, systems transformation, both in the UK and um, in, uh, in other countries, particularly in, uh, in Europe at the present time. And my starting point is that um, I want to focus on the health system rather than the individual. I think when we talk about quality of life, we often get into a debate about individualization, consumer choice, uh, which is fine and not irrelevant and not uh, unimportant, but I think we need to be uh, looking at social systems, uh, structures, and public policy in, in a more macro sense as part of that uh, discussion. Because we're in danger, I think, of losing what we uh, valued in much of our public policy, which is a kind of collectivist tradition in regard to how we as a citizenry uh, connect and uh, value quality of life as a group rather than as a series of individuals. And it seems to me that what better example of that collectivism than the National oh. Health Service, which is approaching 70. It will be 70 in uh, July this year. And uh, it survived not only reasonably intact for that time, but uh, it's clearly uh, still seen to be maybe uh, ahead of the royal family or just behind it, but it's still seen <laughs> to be uh, a major institution that people value and are prepared to invest in. And we heard about that uh, today in a, in a study that was announced, that people are prepared to invest more money. And the government, I think, will offer the NHS a birthday present in July that might uh, be um, more money. However, I don't think it's 
about money entirely, because it's, it's not money itself, it's what you do with that money that's important. And it seems to me that we're um, going through a quiet revolution in the health service. This isn't something that the media or the public know much about or get to hear much about, but it's, <coughs> but it's happening, and it's happening in all health systems globally, because we're all facing similar challenges. We're in what I call the third era of health system transformation. The first two years were about um, disease and ill health uh, and uh, the biomedical model. We're now moving into a social model of health and well-being and how you promote health and how you keep people well and preferably out of hospital. We've been obsessed with bricks and mortar and hospitals and beds for the last 70 years. Now that paradigm shift is uh, beginning to occur where people are talking about health in a more holistic, joined up sense, bringing the physical and the mental aspects of people's uh, health together. You don't hear much about this, but it's happening. It'll be a long journey, a long haul, but when you think that 86% of diseases, the disease burden on the health system is caused by lifestyle-related non-communicable disease that's avoidable and preventable, why are we piling our resources into hospital as opposed to keeping people well in the community and improving their quality of life? And that's the change that's underway uh, in the health service, both here and overseas. And the third era emphasizes that uh, collective, uh, holistic approach to thinking about health and well-being and about the quality of health. It's putting function before form. We've reorganized our health system, God knows how many times, 14, 15 times, and all we do is change the structure, change the furniture. We've, ne we've never dealt with the culture of the system and how it operates to improve health and well-being. We're beginning to, to do that now. We're beginning to realize that we've spent far too much attention and resource on form, not on function. We're now looking at the whole issue of function. The third era is about improving lifestyle-related diseases, whole systems thinking, interconnected care across public health, across social care, uh, health in the community, seeing the NHS in communities as, as, as a resource, as, as a fixed asset. The NHS in some areas is the only employer. It's certainly a major employer. It invests heavily in staff, in employment, in uh, real estate. Uh, it ought to be contributing to the economy and the social structures of those communities and improving their health and well-being. It's not just a hospital treating people, it's part of that community. And that thinking is beginning to take root now. Challenges as we go forward, and I'll end on this point, we need a radical uplift to public health. We need to get away from thinking about hospitals all the time. We need to improve the health of, of people living in the community. We have to focus on place, on communities, on the social determinants of health. What are the factors contributing to health and ill health that, that are upstream, not downstream? We need to move from being over-specialised. We, we, we train doctors now to deal with bits of the body as opposed to the whole body. We need to get back to the generalist, the person who can link the bits of the body together into a holistic view of health and health care. We've got to use the workforce more creatively, use pharmacists, use nurses, use um, physician associates in quite different ways. This isn't about money. It's not doing more of what we've done uh, in a repetitive way. It's about doing things differently to meet that quality of life agenda. It's about new forms of leadership across the whole system, not managing a hospital, but managing a whole raft of organizations working together for a community and a place-based function. And it's about relationship building. It's getting away from structures and working with people to make things happen in quite new and different ways, soft skills. And finally, we need to see the NHS, as I say, as an anchor institution in, in, in its community in order to enable people in those communities to, to prosper, where they, you know, there may be no other industry, no other work, no other employment, but the NHS is there, and it's there for the long haul. It ought to be contributing to that community and that sense of well-being and quality of life. So my plea is simply to not think micro, but to think macro, and look at the whole public policy realm and how health policy in particular can be made to fit this agenda around quality of life. Well, I did uh, think that David uh, would uh, be provocative in opening the debate, and we've already got paradigm shift in there in just the first uh, <laughs> half an hour or so. So um, thank you, David. I'm going to pass immediately over to Kimberly. Uh, th thank you, Sam, for inviting me. Uh, thank you to BIS and to the University of Durham. I, I'd like to start with a story. This is from uh, an American legal comedy series that finished its run many years ago, so I'm not going to tell you which one it is. The fact I know it shows how old I am. Uh, the story is about two friends. One's Mr. Michelson, who's a CEO, and the other is Mr. Bernie Gilson, who's a homeless man. So Mr. Michelson passes Mr. Gilson one day and takes him inside a restaurant and gives him a bowl of soup. 
And it turns out they actually have some things to chat in common. You know, base, you know, they like the same basketball team and so on. And so they start to meet regularly, and Mr. Michelson always buys Mr. Gilson a bowl of soup. And then over some time, he eventually gives him a job as a janitor in his company. And then some years later, Mr. Michelson discovers that he has an incurable heart disease and he will soon die. And Mr. Gilson uh, wants to give his friend his heart. And so they seek legal permission to swap hearts. And um, the lawyer who's you know, trying to put forward this case, and, and I'm quite possibly at the time this story was written, this was not a live option, but uh, they, they play with this possibility that you could swap hearts. Um, the lawyer asks Mr. Gilson, you know, wh why are you doing this? And Mr. Gilson says, if I were to list all my life's accomplishments on a piece of paper here, there's the list without the paper. This is the first chance I've ever had to do something important. I can die never having done anything, or I can die giving life to a person I love, giving children their father. Imagine thinking when you go, it'll have mattered that you lived, and then consider the alternative. And, and so then you know, they have the court, uh, you know, their, their attempt to <coughs> convince a judge to agree to this, and their petition to swap hearts is denied. And so there's a scene in the courthouse hallway after the ruling, which is very interesting. The lawyer says, you know, Mr. Gilson, you seem to measure a man's worth by what he does. My math, it goes to more what he is. Any man willing to sacrifice himself for a friend, for children, for anybody's children. Mr. Gilson, how is that even remotely relevant to my private decision? The lawyer comes back, it's relevant because your decision was based in part on your wanting to be something, and I'm saying you already are. And then Michelson pipes up and he, he says, you know, I never would have taken your heart, Bernie. And Gilson says, what? I didn't figure any judge would say yes to this, not for a second. Then what are we doing here? She's right, the lawyer, she's right. You needed to see this through for your sake, and you did. And Gilson retorts, you went through this so that I could feel like a hero. Michelson, a little, but maybe to make me a hero. See, I've always measured a man by his friends. I tell my kids that. And when I die, they're not going to look at my title or my will. They're going to say, look at the friend he had in Bernie Gilson, willing to give him his own heart. Wow. And, and, and I like this story because it, it sort of leads into some reflection about questions that philosophers love to ask, which is, what makes for a good life? What makes for a meaningful life? What does it mean to thrive or to flourish? And in a way, Mr. Mr. Gilson, he, he pushes against some ideas we might take for granted. Um, you know, we sometimes might mistake longevity for a good life, or, a, you know, if, or at least with a minimum standard of health that longevity makes for a good life. But the, the philosopher Joseph Raz has pointed out that biological self-interest can be divorced from well-being. He says, a person's well-being is not reduced by the shortening of his life nor by the frustrating of his biological needs when this is the means or the accepted byproduct of his pursuit of a valuable goal. A person who undergoes great deprivation in order to bring medical help to the victims of an epidemic is sacrificing his biological interest in favor of others, but his, not, his life is no less successful, rewarding, or accomplished. So it's a provo you know, provocative thought. Um, the other reason I love, that I really like this story is it, it points to a feature of a, a good life that you know, we're starting to put to the, to the front of our conversation about well-being, but which is, has been sidelined to some extent until recently, and that is how important affiliation and companionship are to a good life. And the thing that Mr. Gilson brings out is that having companionship and affiliation, it's not just you know, being secure in a friendship for your own sake, but actually we have a deep need to be needed, uh, that we highly prize being valuable to other people. 
And so to, to comment briefly on structures, you know, how social, political, cultural, religious, military structures can affect our, our abilities to pursue a good life, these structures can either help us or hinder us in the social aspects of our well-being. And so someone like Mr. Gilson is willing to do something so extreme because in a way he's never had any other real opportunities to be meaningful to someone. And that's partly because our social interests intersect with our material interests. If you live in poverty, if you're poorly educated, um, if you are physically impaired or mentally impaired, if you are you know, in other ways socially disadvantaged, stigmatized, and so on, that compromises your efforts to be of use to someone else. And so, so one thing I'm trying to argue is that we do an injustice to people when we fail to recognize that they have a capacity to, stay, to sustain others, and when we fail to support them in their efforts. Um, you know, children, for example, we tend to view children as socially needy, socially receiving, not socially giving. But children give a fantastic amount socially. They're forever bidding for connection, trying to connect with people. Um, we do an injustice to someone when we coercively deny them social contact. People <clears throat> we put in solitary confinement and segregation, even for a short period, we are rendering them impotent, leaving them at the you know, to only hope that someone will come to them to engage in social contact, leaving them without the opportunity to be of use. Um, and indeed, the incidentally isolated person is also someone we do an injustice to. If someone needs some help to get out of the house in order to stay social, in order to continue to see their grandchildren or to be of use to a friend, in allowing them to be left unattended, to fend for themselves, not to provide some support so they can stay social, we do them an injustice. Um, there is a nice Guardian article uh, the, the day before yesterday, I think, uh, called The Friend Effect. It was by Jenny Stevens, um, saying that sort of the, the key to our well-being is actually very simple. And it's essentially, um, if you have someone to share a meal with, to share a bowl of soup with regularly, you're much more likely to be happy. And people who eat alone all the time are 7.9 points lower than the national average in terms of happiness. Um, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> so a demonstration of the same theme um, and asking big questions, but from very different kind of angles. So um, excellent. Um, uh, over to Brett. Uh, Echoing everybody else, thank you for the kind invite and a specific thanks to somebody who hasn't been mentioned, and that's Linda. Thank you for the amazing organization, wherever you are. <laughs> this dovetails quite nicely because uh, we know it's complex, but I'll focus upon one area, that is storytelling. Dovetails nicely. Um, for me, stories are wonderful. They take care of people. They are great companions in our lives for enhancing our quality of life. But also, we shouldn't ignore the fact that stories can also be dangerous. They can cause trouble for us. And if I may, I would like to give some examples from some of the work I've been doing for the last 15 years with disabled people, and in particular, spinal cord injured people. I just want to preface this with why stories. I could give you all the academic literature from anthropology, talking about how we're storytelling animals, from neuropsychology about how stories are so significant in our lives, et cetera, et cetera. But I come back down to a basic test, which I call the bedtime test. If anybody's got a child in this room, try telling them a statistical test. Give them a meta-analysis that you may have done. Mm -hmm. Give them uh, whatever it might be. But give them a story, things change. And that leads to the heart of stories, because stories are not passive. They do things. They entertain us, they motivate us, etc. But one thing I want to highlight is that stories are particularly important for taking care of us, for enhancing our quality of life, and also making our lives dangerous in terms of quality of life. And to give the example from spinal cord injury, every eight minutes, a person suffers a paralysis. We have in total, in the UK at the very least, over 13 million disabled people, and 
approximately uh, 50 to 60,000 people with a spinal cord injury. Not insignificant. And I've been working with uh, organizations such as Disability Rights UK and Aspire and other organizations to not simply, but to examine the stories that people tell and to understand the effect that it has on their lives, including the quality of life. Now, one story that many people tell following a spinal cord injury, and that could be, for example, a spinal cord injury that occurs through rugby, through uh, an accident, such as a car accident, or alternatively through shooting. We should also uh, at least acknowledge that it's a very gendered experience. Approximately 81% of spinal injuries happen to men, okay? We're stupid. We shoot the guns. We drive fast. We do silly sports, okay? There's a gender dimension to this. But moving aside from that, one common story that I frequently witness in rehabilitation centers and in the community is what we've termed the restitution narrative. And it comes from a, uh, a sociologist, and I've imported that uh, from uh, the cancer literature into disability studies. And the restitution narrative very simply goes as follows. Yesterday, I was able-bodied. Today, I'm spinal cord injured and disabled. But at some point in the future, I will walk again. I will walk again. And that is crucial for my quality of life. <clears throat> okay. Well, that story in and of itself might seem obvious to some people. But one should remember it's not a story that suddenly an individual conjures up. It's embedded within our structures our medical structures, our universities trying to fight for resources to promote stem cell surgery, for example, and uh, other uh, structures such as the sporting and exercise as science structure, where we're attempting to promote exercise as medicine. I could outline numerous centers around the world that are claiming that through intensive exercise, you will be cured of your spinal cord injury. You will walk again, okay? Just check out the internet. You'll also find doctors allegedly curing that through stem cell surgery. This happens. So it's real. It's embedded within our structures. It's passed down to people. People absorb it. People use it. People tell it. And people live by it. But whilst I'm not saying that story uh, doesn't take care of certain people at certain times, over a period of time, it becomes a dangerous story to live by. It reduces people's quality of life significantly for many different reasons. One is people's economic resources get absorbed through chasing the miraculous dream of stem cell surgery. So you'll see people uh, volunteering to run the London Marathon to raise people uh, money for this. You'll also uh, see people in terms of how this story is dangerous, saying, well, for example, there's no point uh, dealing with disability politics. Why? Because it doesn't matter because tomorrow or at some point in the future, I will be walking again. So people's lives are put on hold. Relationships over a period of time start breaking down. Partners leave them, knowing full well that this miraculous cure won't arrive. Uh, whilst equally at the same time, people are profiting from this uh, narrative that we are peddling throughout the various structures that we're operating in. So my, my simple plea is this that the stories that we share, the stories we pass down, the stories we legitimize in our various contexts help frame people's quality of life. And what I would particularly be interested in is rather than a focus on one specific taught story. So within disability, it's, it's a simple dichotomy. Walk again story and the heroic narrative of the Paralympian, or alternatively, the politicized story uh, that goes with the social model and so on. But what I would much prefer to see is a, much, a diversity of stories, a broader landscape of stories that people can access, that people can be reflexively considered to choose, so that when stories are, are not taking care of people, but are becoming dangerous for them, they have an alternative resource to draw upon, to live by, to move and to hopefully improve their quality of life. And we all play a part of that. We're all storytelling animals. Um, so, so again, a similar kind of use of, of narrative, but the meaning and the way it's used as an analytic tool to problematize an area quite different from uh, that, our speakers. Bill. Right, well, 
I, I must repeat the general thanks for allowing me to be part of this delightful evening. It's always a joy for me to be back connected with Durham in, in any capacity. Um, uh, now, for me, lacking any kind of a academic discipline, I, I've obviously had to approach this from a more general angle. And um, so I thought about what, you know, what does quality of life mean to me? And it seemed to me that, at least as far as I'm concerned, it falls resoundingly into two fairly self-evident categories. Um, on the one hand, there's personal quality of life. And that's those things that are peculiar to each of us. And mostly we have agency over ourselves, but all of those things that, that determine your own personal uh, well-being and, and happiness in the world at large, obvious things like um, you know, having good health and avoidance of chronic pain and being reasonably economically secure and um, having happy and stable relationships and all of those kinds of things. I mean, I think they're more or less universal qualities. They might vary slightly from person to person. I imagine, for instance, that my, my great wish for Donald Trump Jr. to be imprisoned probably features higher on my quality of life index than it does on other people's. I know we all want Donald Trump Sr. in prison. That would take you for granted. But I really won't be happy unless that smug git of a son of his goes down with him. But apart from that, I think these are mostly, we all would have special things that are just you know, particular to us. But mostly these are obvious universal qualities. And then the second type of, quali type of quality of life is, is the larger one, which uh, David mentioned. And that's the, you know, the community or societal quality of life. And those are all of the things that society gives us that we cannot provide for ourselves. Again, very obvious things like health care and infrastructure and educational opportunities and just a, a basically decent society. Uh, and, and one I think that's a particular key point is one, it's got to be one that we can all have some faith in, that we're investing our trust in people to look after us uh, in, in a reasonably um, reliable and trustworthy way. Now, it also seems to me that, that probably at no time in my life has the personal quality of, of life been higher than it is right now. Some people may argue with that, but I think just in terms of you think of what young people have today compared with what I had when I was young, um, it's their life is just so much richer. They have so much more in the way of opportunities for travel. Um, the internet gives them connectedness to the, all the, the whole of the planet. They can get information at, at a click. Um, and, and just you know the, the opportunities and the, the richness of their lives is, I think, just so much better and more exciting than it was when when I was young. But at the same time, I think that the greater quality of life, the societal quality of life, has probably diminished. And not just in Britain, I'm thinking of really, certainly the United States, the other country I know very well about. And, and principally because of a sort of loss of faith in the people that are leading us. And, if, and a, a really kind of gloomy sense we all have to live with now that the future is not very bright. Wherever you look, it's just kind of dispiriting. And there's this no sense of, of it being great and, and very promising. And I find that really unnerving. And, and I think there's a kind of universal sense among most of us that we're, our fates are in the hands of some fairly mediocre people <laughs> looking after us, wherever we are. Uh, and that there's no alternatives to these mediocre people. The, uh, the alternative parties are pretty well peopled with mediocrities as well. So it's just, it's quite, a, I think, a kind of a, generally a fairly depressing situation. And what's interesting, I think, about that is that it's more or less exactly the opposite of the situation that was some 40 years ago when I first came to Britain. At that time, personal quality of life was probably pretty depressed compared with today, but, but the community, societal quality of life was much higher. And certainly in terms of your sort of faith in, in the society. And, the thing that I would like to see discussed is, first of all, is that correct? Do other people agree with that? But also, is, it, is that if, if one goes down, must the other go up and vice versa? Are they connected in a way that they sort of balance? Or can they both be at the, could they both be at an optimal level? Uh, is there anything to stop them both being, both being at an optimal level? And, and if so, what can we do to get there? I think particularly to do with the, with the question of the greater society and its responsibilities to us, I think that's a real issue, is how do we get better people to look after us? How do we get better politicians? And how do we get, get ourselves out of this 
these messes that, that we are, are facing with, you know, with Brexit and climate change and everything. I don't have to tell it all to you. But I think those are really seriously beginning to impede not only societal quality of life, but even personal quality of life, because it's just so hopeless. <laughs> okay, okay. Not that positive note. <laughs> so we've got plenty, plenty to um, unpack and, uh, and discuss. Um, uh, there are the certain streams or, or themes, I think, coming across everything uh, that has been mentioned so far. But I wanted to, I suppose, pick up on something Bill said about, you know, um, where to, to begin this societal level potential change, but with a phrase that David used, um, uh, thinking upstream. Um, and to explore you know, what, what interventions might that be? Um, what, how could we imagine that manifesting? Um, and you know, what would be the catalyst to produce that? Would it be, uh, Bill doesn't think government, obviously, um, but where might the in intervention lie? So David, I know you've used the term upstream. upstream. Could you mm -hmm. explicate your thinking a bit more there? Yeah, I mean, just picking up on, on, on Bill's point about that. I mean, I think um, government policy is important, but not necessarily led from the center. I think it needs to pick up Thank what uh, people in communities locally need and want to do and can be empowered to do. Uh, so I think communities in control is, is a theme. Um, but I think the public realm, uh, I think we are losing the public realm in the UK, maybe not as rapidly as in the US and some other places, but uh, there is um, uh, neoliberalism, austerity, uh, the crash in 2008-10 has uh, meant people have lost trust in uh, politicians and globalization in the system, whatever. Um, and governments are partly to blame for that. I mean, uh, I, I totally agree. Uh, we're led by pygmies at the moment. We're not led by uh, people of any caliber at all. Uh, but that's partly because I think our political parties are subject to a form of institutional corruption in terms of the lobbying system here. Uh, we don't have people in government who can stand up to vested interests, and yet health and quality of life is partly governed by a series of corporate vested interests that we need to confront, and that's certainly the case in, in healthy lifestyles. And government policy is often rhetorically saying the right thing, but when it comes to implementation, we seem to get reduced down to a kind of individual behavior change thing, you know, nudging someone and reducing <laughs> the number of holes in a salt cellar. So when you get your fish and chips, you're, you're, you're shaking salt out of 12 holes as opposed to 20 holes, and that's supposed to change behavior. Uh, and, and make us healthy overnight. I mean, that's just, that nudge philosophy uh, is, uh, has a place, but we've started kind of reified it to being the solution. And it's not the solution, it's one part of the solution. But this, this what we've called, some of us have called lifestyle drift. Government policy sets out to tackle the big issues and then ends up blaming the individual for not sorting their health out. Uh, so you have a blaming the victim approach. So you end up going downstream as opposed to going upstream. Uh, and I think that's where government policy needs to be... Um, stress more. Yesterday there was a story about the uh, fact that the voluntary agreement with the industry hasn't reduced um, uh, sugar in, uh, in food and people are getting more obese as we go by. Obesity is costing the NHS £15 billion pounds a year. You know, we can deal with these issues. People actually would welcome government policy that's helping them address those issues in a collective, joined up way. Not being told what to do, not the nanny state, but actually working with people to address these issues. But we have no, we have no capacity for that. And Partly, that, the problem in the UK at the moment is that Brexit is sucking the oxygen out of every other policy area. So we're faced with a whole raft of domestic policy problems around health and well-being that just aren't being addressed because everyone's obsessed with Brexit. Rightly or wrongly, that's my take on it, that we've actually reduced the ability of government to govern. Brett, how does that um, um, align with your call for uh, well, observation of the danger of narratives? But where have you seen a narrative emerge from that could perhaps change things or be more positive. Have you any examples of, of those in your own research? I will do, but if I may act like a politician and go back go uh, to, a, to, a, to a question about, remind me and I will address that one. I, I do have a response. But I, I think you've, you've hit an important point around behaviour change theories and nudging. If anybody's in academia, it's a, it's a huge thing. And when you work with, for example, Public Health England, which mm. I work with them quite considerably, they hold a great deal of value on this. And I think we as academics and as general public should start questioning some of these taken for granted theories, not least because many of my colleagues, myself included, have 
risen quite highly in academia through these theories, uh, and we've invested a great deal of energy and time in them, and I think it's time that we actually gave up on many of them, or at least critically reflected upon them, and start injecting a lot more social and relational elements in them, rather than this simplistic, individualistic, neoliberal uh, behavior change approach that is largely dominant in terms of trying to improve people's health, well-being, and quality of life. And we need to see that gone. Now remind me of the question, please. <laughs> I'm going to your style back at you and, and um, ask, I'm really keen to hear what Kimberly uh, wants to, to say here, because do you see, do you see you know, the, uh, uh, the titans of the NHS docking, knocking on the door of the philosophers, saying we need your, your input to, to understand um, the, the uh, quality of life as a, a social interactional requirement or expectation? Um, so the, the philosophers who think about quality of life, they start with the thought that we should approach those kinds of questions with wonder. Um, and the NHS and, and anyone looking for numbers is not going to want much wonder. Uh, and so, so I think that the philosopher tries to offer a caution that if you're fleshing out quality of life in a mechanistic or a formulaic way, you know, looking for data, you're going to lose the complex aspects of a human life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, I think Brett, you know, I, I really admire his recommendation of having a diversity of stories, uh, a diverse set of stories about an experience. And, and one question that raises is, or one opportunity it gives is to raise a question about someone's testimony. Because in a, in a way, a story is someone's take on their experience, their effort to make you see from the inside how they've understood what they've experienced. And if you're looking to a range of stories, then you have the chance to not doubt their testimony, but to put it in context, that there are other ways of, other intuitive takes on an experience. Um, so, so I think the philosophers have a role to play, but certainly not in providing answers. It's more in providing, in asking uncomfortable questions uh, that should, should lead us to feel a, a, a bit cautious about our metrics and our confidence when we say, okay, this is the way forward, this is going to fix things. Does that, um, Bill, you used the, the term agency, and that's something that has a, a great deal of, of um, attention in, in sociological um, kind of uh, circles. But linking in with finding questions, um, we've talked about the, you know, the life course, and I think you mentioned uh, that life, you know, across the life course, there might be different stages or expectations of a, of a quality of life. Are we therefore thinking that we can't have an equilibrium across the life course, that it would be something that would perhaps... Uh, adjust and change um, and have maybe different narratives across that or what so how, I'll say okay. more about well I don't I mean I don't I don't know if this will directly answer your question but it, it while you were all talking something I was just reminded of something that happened to me today and that's that I was um, I, I was walking across London today and um, I got I, I was hungry it was lunchtime and so uh, because it was a nice day at that time of the day I went and, and just got a sandwich, and uh, I was by Hyde Park, so I went and sat in Hyde Park and, and ate this sandwich. And as you can imagine, it was an entirely agreeable situation, and I was, I was very happy. But as I was sitting there, I also noticed that, that on the edge of the bench, I was on an empty bench, on the ed other edge of the bench, right as far from me as possible on the bench, somebody had, at some time in the last couple of days, had eaten a banana and had just gotten up and left the skin on the bench. And so it had been there for a couple of days, and it was horrible. It was all grody and black and just... And I just, because I had nothing else to do, I sat there and I kept looking at it, and I was just thinking, you know, how do you do that? I mean, how can you be that inconsiderate of others? And, um, and you know, you would think that at the very least they would at least put it on the ground or throw it in the bushes or do something. Uh, I mean, I, I don't entirely blame a person for not wanting to carry a banana around for the rest of the day. And I did look to see if there were, you know, where, where's the nearest dustbin? And you could see about 500 meters in every direction. There were no dustbins. And I just thought, so this isn't entirely the person's fault. This is also, you know, a larger fault. And, and it made me feel that kind of the, you know, that, that keeping litter off of our streets and just anything like that, it's got to be a compact between the individual and the greater society. I think, you know, I think the, the local authority, whoever is the management authority in these situations, has a duty to provide us with some way of disposing our rubbish, because 
that just makes it easier for us, but it's also sensible for, in their own interest. It gives them you know, less rubbish to have to sweep up. Uh, and it would just make the world a better place. Anywhere you go in the world where your city streets are very, very clean, you will see litter bins just everywhere, every, every 15 or 20 feet. And um, we all know for various historical reasons they've been taken away here, but those historical reasons no longer really apply and they ought to be put back. So I was just struck by the fact that, 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 that this, was, you know, this was some human being being a jerk and, and really needed to be upbraided for that, but it was also partly excused by the fact that, that he didn't have any place, or she perhaps, didn't have any place that, to put this discarded product, which nobody wants to carry around. You know, you're not going to put an empty banana skin in your briefcase and hold on to it for the rest of the day. <laughs> and, and that made me think, that finally, additionally, that, that maybe, you know, maybe sometimes a nudge is actually uh, appropriate, because I do think that, that people need from time to time to be reminded that you do have responsibilities as a citizen, that you do... Um, you know, the, the, it is, a nudge wouldn't be intended to change your behavior, but just to remind you that, because I think a lot of people need reminding that there are actually expectations of you and obligations on you as a, as a citizen. Um, so I think we've got a bit of a tension um, already between kind of uh, whether it lies in us or whether we should expect the state or a more structural body to, to intervene. Um, and some of the kind of terminology here, I know we've used nudge a, a few times here, but it's something Kimberly said about you know, the reciprocity we might have in, in, in our relationships. Um, but also something Bill said almost about surveillance at the same time, uh, you know, our obligations need uh, to be kept an eye on. I suppose I'd welcome hearing you know, the panel's views on where that balance, that between overstepping the mark, becoming a nanny state, too much surveillance, um, uh, and whether you know, we can expect you know, um, not people to put that banana skin in the briefcase, but be prepared to, to walk more than 500 yards to, towards the bin. Where, where's the balance, I suppose, I'm, I'm keen to hear. Please. So um, I think the state and the law can help us to be moral. Um, but not, not best through CCTV cameras. You know, it was 14 million a little while ago. I don't know what it's up to now. But um, being watched, being surveyed, that's not the strategy. It's better to lead by example. Um, so you, know, you can model virtue for people in how you treat the most vulnerable in your society, how our state treats the most vulnerable. How does our state treat people seeking asylum? Um, how does our state treat people who are of ethnic minority? Uh, so, so you can sort of look to your state, and sometimes the state does lead in big moral changes. You know, if if, uh, if it's a Supreme Court judgment that changes the formal position on marriage, you know, in, in enabling people who are homosexual to marry, and that sort of precedes public opinion, the state has led morally, and you know, often public opinion catches up. Um, sometimes it's better for it to be organic. You know, if the state's doing the leading, people can actually resist. Um, it can prevent the opinion from, from following on. But uh, th there are ways we can learn from our state, but not through being, to my mind, not through being watched to be good. Yeah. There's been a lot of um, <clears throat> discussion recently, in recent years, around um, asset-based thinking and uh, letting communities are much more control and say over their lives in the belief that if you give people a stake in the system, they won't throw that banana skin away. They'll uh, dispose of it in the way that they um, would have some pride in doing because they have pride in their, in their, in, in their, in their setting, in their, in their context. And again, asset-based approaches is a bit like um, nudge theory. There's some good in it, but there's also risks in it because uh, you can be um, holding people to account for uh, what happens or doesn't happen in their lives. And you can be saying, we're building on your assets and we're, we're making you more resilient, and that's good for the community, and that's fine, as long as it doesn't slip into to victim blaming, which it, which it can do, I think. Nevertheless, there is an attempt to at least um, recognize that this isn't a top-down agenda. It's about empowering people in the community with whatever assets they have, building on them, developing them, giving them some stake in the system, and then from there, hopefully, looking out into the broader uh, public realm, in a sense, and giving them a stake in their community. So that, that kind of approach, I think, is, I mean, this is all a question of balance. It's not either or. I think it's a question of where we put the emphasis. And arguably, we've neglected this whole area of balance. We've simply lurched from one extreme to the other, not very effectively. 
And I think there's enough evidence now to suggest how we might do these things in a much more nuanced, sophisticated way, because these are hugely complex issues. There's no one single right answer for everybody, but there are um, areas of activity that we can uh, invest in to improve those um, lives of people who presently feel um, overlooked, detached, left out. If I can just pick up on the issue of states and resilience, just to exemplify this, uh, I draw upon stories. And yes, yesterday I was uh, fortunate to be in a in a meeting with uh, the mayor of West Midlands and a wonderful bunch of other colleagues uh, in the West Midlands, and we was talking about education, the state, and how children need to be more resilient and how we can foster resilient children. That seems to be a, a mandate of the government, education systems, and so on. And I listened to it. Everybody was well-meaning. I agreed with many things they said. We shouldn't dismiss things such as, like, no, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, I, I pointed out that what we're doing is point the state, the education system, and my colleagues in the room were pointing the fingers at the children of saying, you, as an individual, must become resilient. Mm. It's your fault. It's your problem. All the issues that are going on around you, uh, that's not the problem. You're the problem. You need to solve it. And we can talk about neoliberalism, et cetera, et cetera. But the simple point is, is that we dissolve too much down to the individual. We dissolve it down to the individual. And it's not working. And it's not good for our quality of life. And it's not good out for our health. And I'll come back to a, uh, two words that you said that will be a companion for me for a long time. I don't think that produces decent citizens, decent people. No. But you, you can approach it differently. There's, there's a, a scheme in uh, Lancashire, well, it's, it's, it's all over the country, but it's being evaluated by Lancashire University, uh, called Communities in Control, where the big lottery funding is giving communities so much money. Mm. Uh, you've maybe heard, heard about it, the Poppy study. Yeah. And um, communities are using that money to, to, to do things differently, the things that they value mm. and have never been able to uh, invest in, uh, things that they think are important, getting some control over their lives. And the biggest thing that people lack is control over their yeah. lives. It's not just self-esteem. That comes through having control over your lives. I mean, Michael Marmot did the Whitehall study decades ago where he showed that middle-ranking uh, civil servants were the most stressed out because they had no control over their lives. Um, so if you give people some sense of um, stake in the system, then the chances are that that resilience will partly emerge. But it's, but it's not either or. It's, it's working together with those groups. Yes, and you've hit a key word on that. In disability studies for 20 years, it's about working with not on exactly. uh, disabled people. Yeah. It's working yeah. with communities. And, and it's, yeah. a, it's a we rather than the I approach. Yeah. And that's what concerns me when, for example, resilience is distilled Absolutely. down from the state and education. It becomes yeah. your, you as an individual that needs to develop a resilient attitude to overcome I all the problems agree. that you face. Yeah. And that's a very good example you gave. From... Someone called it neoliberalism with the community face. Yes. Which is not helping. No. Does uh, resilience have... Um... Resilience in philosophy, does it have any capture? It does seem to be um, you know, almost ubiquitous in, in, in many different areas of, of social science. Is it, does it, is it permeated philosophy to the same degree? No, um, or at least <laughs> not, not what I've read. But that doesn't mean it hasn't. Um, no, so, so there, there is a, a growing philosophy of childhood. Um, and some very interesting contributions to that literature emphasize that there are, um, Yanka Goyce, for example, argues that there are some goods that, in a way, we can only experience in childhood. Um, children tend to be philosophically curious. They tend to be highly artistic. Uh, they, they tend to you know, have wild imaginations, be very creative. They tend to be non-judgmental, less judgmental. And so, so some of the, that you know, sort of rich diversity of goods, it, it, it suggests we shouldn't see children as caterpillars who haven't yet turned into butterflies. We should see them more as um, saplings, or in fact, as their own distinct you know, butterfly, you know, a fully formed, beautiful thing, uh, and that there will be beauty lost in the transition to adulthood. So you know, perhaps resilient isn't, resilience isn't a feature um, that it's sort of best place to look for in childhood. You know, if you found resilience, you might not find these other wonderful qualities or not find them as much. So, um, th so there is an exploration of what it is to be a child um, and, and what makes for a good childhood. Uh, and, and obviously there's a lot of discussion about 
how important the family is and the rights of parents and, and uh, children's interests and the ethics of care. Not a lot of it's framed in the language of resilience. So it's really interesting how it's just completely, yeah, uh, not permeated that uh, particular discourse. I know that something, and it's come up in relation to, to um, resilience, uh, where Brett and David have talked about it, but in relation to community, and community has been appeared in a few things that people um, have said, and people have talked about place um, and community um, um, empowerment and being, you know, uh, incidentally isolated. I think uh, Kimberly mentioned that. So I'm really keen to to hear, I suppose as a rural sociologist, what people um, mean by place and what significance that has, I think, um, in, in, in terms of shaping uh, quality of life. I know Bill particularly has so extensively traveled and what community is in one place. We were talking about Yorkshire earlier. So I'd be keen to hear uh, your understanding of community and its relevance here. Well, well just by chance, I, I, um, when I was, was just sort of looking into quality of life, just kind of Googling quality of life um, things to, to try to prepare for this evening. I found something that sort of touches on that that I thought was really interesting, and that's that um, the OECD uh, has, has a thing, it's called the, the Better Life Index, which is essentially just a quality of life measurement, and they use 11 different measures, uh, 10 of which are objective and one subjective, of comparing not just countries, but, but uh, regions within countries. So for instance, in the United States, it does all 50 states. And in Britain, it does 12 different regions. In France, it would do all the departments and so on. Um, so it's quite geographically precise. And, and of course, um, being somebody who's, who belongs to different places, I, the first thing I did was I looked at Iowa to see where, you know, where I come from. And I was really surprised, but very proud to see that Iowa is the safest state in the United States. The homicide rate there is, is 1.4 per 100,000 people, which puts it quite comfortably in the lead as the safest place. And I then looked to see Greater London, where I live now, how it compared. And I have to say, I wasn't terribly surprised to see that it came last. Out of 12 regions of Britain, it was the least safe place in Britain. But the homicide rate in Greater London is uh, 1.3 per 100,000 people. So it's actually <laughs> lower than in Iowa, which means that the safest place in the United States is still more dangerous than the most dangerous place in Britain. Uh, and I mean, I don't know quite what, what to, you would draw from that, but I thought that was by far the most interesting statistic I stumbled on this week. I congratulate you on finding a really interesting statistic. That is, yeah, um, that is a, a, distinct, a distinctively kind of... Um, it raises problems about how we measure things and how they're comparable. Well, if I may just add to that, because, because one of the other things, the, all of these objects, all, all of the measurements were, were, as I say, were objective. And um, in Iowa, compared with Greater London, it actually did quite poorly on almost all of them. I mean, you, would, you live three years longer if you're living in London than you do if you're in Iowa. Your life expectancy, your um, the mortality rate at birth is... Uh, or no, the mortality rate in a, in a given year, uh, I think it's uh, 8.2 people in Iowa will die per 100,000, 7.3 in, in Greater London. Per one. So in almost all of the m measures, um, I I I Iowa was, was worse off than, than London, which I thought was really, really interesting, except the one measure which was, which was subjective, and that was um, happiness with life. I can't know exactly, life satisfaction. And, and Iowa was like double what... Britain is. Britain was, was the, you know, one of the gloomiest places in the whole world. London was, was it came in the bottom 40% for the planet. It was by far the worst, the most, the most pessimistic place in the United Kingdom. Iowa was almost exactly the opposite, even though it had really not, not any figures that to be very proud of. It came eighth in the nation for happiness. And I, so I do think that part of the problem with these assessments is that they are very, very dubious, um, particularly when, when you allow people to just express how satisfied they are. But interesting nonetheless. And I mean, I think there's some actual value in seeing how people rate themselves and how very often they're really essentially completely misguided in their own judgments. <laughs> Um, so in terms of um, uh, thinking about community and whether a community can be empowered to, to make a difference um, and 
I think there, um, I've done some research with colleagues at, at Durham looking at the, the former pit villages in, in, in County Durham. And I think there's going to be a, a, a very big difference between that and perhaps gentrified areas of, of Norfolk or in the commuter belt, um, my sort of home county of Northamptonshire. So I wonder, uh, I'd welcome kind of David's view because I know he's done comparisons across you know, the globe. And I know you've talked about Cuba as offering a really interesting example of, yeah. of a healthcare system. Uh, so I'm kind of concerned about whether community empowerment can be equitable in different circumstances and whether place interferes with, for want of a better phrase, uh, the, that level playing field of empowerment. Um, yeah. Um, well, um, I mean, place, funnily enough, is now becoming um, more, uh, more of an issue in health policy. Uh, people are talking about having healthy cities. Uh, there are 11 healthy cities in the UK now, from Devon to Darlington. I don't know what they're doing or how they're being made more healthy at a time of massive spending cuts. But um, it's about redesigning the architecture, the planning, where cars are parked, if you have cars at all, um, using digital technology to enable people to stay in their own homes longer without having to seek care and so on. So there's, there's that movement. There's also an attempt to um, think about place in relation to joined up services across a whole area, um, there's horrible jargon. You've got things called STPs, which some people think means sticky toffee pudding, but it means uh, sustainability and transformation plans uh, or programs, depending on how you want to play the P word. Um, these things come and go. They've been replaced now by accountable care systems. They've been replaced because accountable was too American, so that meant privatization. So they've changed accountable to integrated care systems. So we're now in the midst of setting up integrated care systems across whole communities in England. Um, that will be based on place and bringing services together and pulling budgets for that whole area. So it'll bring local government, the health service, primary care, social care together into one agreed boundary, um, all of which will require quite sophisticated and subtle system leadership, which we don't generally have in this country in the health system, requiring all kinds of new skills, um, but nevertheless thinking holistically about a place. So, so that's encouraging at one level, provided you've got the means to make it happen. And that, that's what I, all health systems are grappling with now. They, they kind of know what to do, the vision's there, uh, but they don't know quite how to do it, how to make it happen, how you get the political buy-in, how you get the population on board, because the minute you go out to the public, they think all oh, this is about um, cutting services and about um, losing their local hospital. Well, given the hospitals are the most unhealthy places to be in, losing hospitals might actually be a good thing. But people become obsessed with keeping their hospital in their community, whether it's the right thing or not. So you've got a real problem in terms of communication, how you get the public on board, and how you get politicians on board. But nevertheless, it's an attempt to at least shift the paradigm. I think the Cuban system is interesting because um, the Cuban health statistics are remarkably impressive given the kind of country it is and given the amount of poverty there is and given uh, what they spend on public services. But what they do do is they train their doctors differently. They train their doctors in a much more holistic way. Doctors are trained to be primary care physicians working in the community. The hospital's at the end of the line. It's not the first port of call. The hospital, if anything, is a failure of the system. You actually work with people to keep them in the community. And the whole training has been turned on its head in Cuba to remarkably... Um, good effect with impressive results. Uh, we don't do that. The United States doesn't do it. We are over-medicalized. We, we don't treat the life course as, a, as an issue for medical students. We don't prepare people for a good death. Atul Gawande, in his wonderful book, uh, which I can't remember the title of now, someone will know, The Mortal, is it Mortal something or other? Being Mortal. Being Mortal. Being mortal. Uh, it's a wonderful book, and if you haven't read it, it comes from a physician who says that we fail to prepare people for a good death. We're so obsessed with over-treating them and medicalizing the, the problems that we haven't, we've lost sight of the individual, the whole person. And in that sense, um, I think um, there are huge opportunities to, to not just rethink place, but rethink what we do in those places with the professionals that we've got. Again, it's not about money, it's about doing things differently. And that doesn't necessarily involve any more money, sometimes involve less money. So we're obsessed with money in this country around healthcare mm. investment, and that's an mm. issue, but it's not the only issue, and arguably not the most important issue. And it shouldn't distract us from what needs to change in the system to take a more holistic place-based view, and that's potentially happening, but it needs to happen with people in that system who are trained to work differently from the current medical profession we have. Mm. Brett, yeah, do you want to, sorry, or Kimberly? Oh, no, go for it. Yeah. No, please. Okay. Polite, aren't we? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll just give you an example from uh, disabled people around the significance of place, quality of life. Um, if we look at spinal cord injury, uh, you acquire a spinal cord injury. We used to 
uh, allow people in hospital for nine months. Uh, now it's three months out of the door. Uh, one out of five people now end up in a care home. And bear in mind that many spinal cord injured people are 18, 19. So imagine your 18, 19 year old, 18, 19 year old young son ends up in a care home with people who are 80 with dementia, et cetera. Very different place to be, not for three months, for three years. Mm quality of life suffers, suicide is not uncommon, the work uh, we've done with them. So what I'm saying as part of this is when we're thinking about place and space, of course, because this is very much intertwined, often we think in a very narrow-minded view, and what I mean by that, a very able-bodied uh, perspective. And of course, we can interject and say disabled people, 13 million of them, but of course, we're an aging population. Uh, anybody that's pushed a pram around London would certainly benefit from easy, accessible uh, places that disabled people would uh, say is necessity for enabling their quality of life, and it's also a form of discrimination. So I think we've got to very much put it on the agenda uh, in terms of different types of bodies operating in different types of uh, spaces, and people who are, for example, architects need to be trained about this, and we don't have any of these issues largely on architect courses. And my final point, it struck me, uh, I use Twitter as a great data source, uh, of course, not the most objective form of data, we might argue. <laughs> but th this pointed to me to little acts of generosity that occur in spaces. We can talk about it at the structural level at the macro, but I'm also very interested in the micro. And you know, for me, how many people speak to their neighbors? How many people help them with their dustbins? And so on and so forth. And the example that I got from yesterday from Twitter, a, a jogger was going up a hill. Hill he runs up apparently uh, every day of the week. Everybody goes past him. Uh, he was running up the hill. He put up his hand high, just just a stretch. He was running up. A runner who he'd never seen before ran past him, gave him a big high five. He's to quote on Twitter, "I was smiling for the rest of the day." Those little acts of generosity, I think, were lacking, and I think we need to have more of in places. <laughs> uh, well, I'd say here here to that. There's some. Um... And there's work done by social psychologists such as Barbara Friedrichsen, which talk, uh, it talks about the micro moments of connection and how those are very good for your health. Um, and that actually our, our hearts um, respond to that. And it's, you either you, you, you use it or you lose it. That uh, you know, engaging in those, having those opportunities is very good for us. Um, just, just briefly on place, what, one idea uh, that's explored a, lot, explored a lot in psychology, but not so much in philosophy, and I, I'm trying to um, kickstart a conversation on it, is the idea of the need to belong. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the need to belong has a strong temporal and physical dimension to it. So it's, I need to belong with these people in this place, um, in this time, of this generation, in, in this community, in this house, even. And... Um, People who, uh, people, one set of people who are very, very vulnerable are people who've committed criminal offenses. And um, we, f for potentially legitimate reasons, sometimes hold people in facilities far away from their place. Uh, so, you know, there are, there are overspilled prisons for people who've committed offenses in London. There are national <coughs> hubs for people who've committed sexual offenses. And that stretches or severs your social bonds. If you're in prison for four years more um, for an offense, that's a big demand on family that they you know, routinely go to where you are in order to maintain the connection. So I think we, you know, in attending to um, you know, sort of <laughs> pooling local resources and budget priorities and so on, we, we can lose track of the importance of, of place and, and of family connection in, in people's lives. And, and you know, we don't have to be warm and fuzzy, you know, bleeding heart liberal to see that there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a value in doing this. People are more likely to desist if they have a non-criminal social context that they can put themselves back into. You're more likely to desist from offending if you don't see yourself as an offender, mm -hmm. if you see yourself as a, a father who made a mistake, you know, a, a wife who made a mistake and who has other people who can present themselves and present you as something other than your offense. So we, we lose out in not attending to place. Mm. Yeah, and in a way, the, the whole um, obsession with choice 
has made place um, more difficult to uh, conceptualise, because politicians seem to think, for some reason, even though the public never asked for it, the politicians seem to think people wanted choice. And choice could be having care anywhere in the country you wanted. But people don't want care in other mm -hmm. parts of the country for the reasons you've said. They want to be near their families, near their loved ones. And if you give people the, uh, if you ask them the question, they say, what we want are safe, local, quality services in our local neighbourhood. We don't want choice that's uh, 50 miles down the road or 100 miles across the country. We want um, to be um, secure and safe in the facilities that we have locally. Why can't that be delivered? And now, for some things, highly specialised treatments, that might be a problem. But for, for most things, that's not an unrealistic ambition. Uh, and yet, for some reason, politicians, again, disconnected from the public, seem to voice choice on them as something that they wanted and must be desirable. But where's that come from? Because it's not something the public have been hankering for. But, but we've commodified things like health, like education, that arguably shouldn't be commodified. They're public assets. They're things that should be there for the whole community. But we've made them like washing machines or buying an aircraft ticket or whatever, you know, that somehow people want choice. They've got choice in every other domain of their lives, so why not in health? Well, maybe it doesn't fit health. I, it, this is just reminding me, when, when I first came to this country in 1972, the first job I had, the thing that made me end up staying here was I just entirely by chance stumbled into a job at a psychiatric hospital in Surrey. Mm. And and it was a 500-bed hospital. Almost all the patients were long-term patients. And they were, they were barking mad, but in a kind of harmless, <laughs> well-institutionalized way. I mean, they were all, they needed serious, they, they needed you know, to be in a facility. Mm. And yet, because they were so um, habituated to, to the environment there, they were able to go into the village, a, a great many of them, probably at least 200 of the 500 could go into the village every day. They could go to the bedding shop and put some money down on a horse. They could go and buy cigarettes. They could have a cup of tea in the cafe. And, and many, many of them did. They, they did. And their quality of life was really quite excellent, mm. all things considered, as a result of this. It had nothing to do with care. It was just the system allowed them to, to go and do this. Um, and then in the early 1980s, there was a fire at the, at the psychiatric hospital, uh, quite a serious one, and they closed it down quite abruptly. And they moved all of these people into a, a section, into an annex at a general hospital in Chertsey down the road. And, and at the beginning, they allowed them to wander off the way they always had, but, but because this was a general hospital, they were, getting in, they were causing all kinds of mayhem. They didn't know the place, and they were ending up in storerooms and just disrupting the general run of a general hospital. And they were alarming people in the waiting rooms and that kind of thing, um, because they were quite out of touch with reality. So they all had to be locked up. And they lost every single one of these poor souls, lost their liberty, lost virtually all of their quality of life because of that. And, it's, and so it's not really necessarily a question always of, of spending money or of, of resources. These people were going to have to be looked after one way or another. But it's just, you know, there must be intelligent ways of doing it or more thoughtful ways of doing these things sometimes. And situations that you could apply, you know, this might work here and not there, but, but you know, that you could do, have some flexibility in it. And anyway, there was one of the great... I can remember so clearly when I first came here and I first saw this village with Virginia Water with all of these really quite crazy people wandering. Around. Sometimes, you know, they'd be in their pajamas and going into the bakery and buying something. And they're just, and yet everybody was used to them and everybody in the village, you know, accommodated them. And I, I really genuinely thought, what a great country. What a fantastic <laughs> place this is. Um, you know, this was such an enlightened way of, of looking after, um, you know, disturbed people. And it's, it's all lost now. So, so it's kind of a real sad loss from my own life. Um, we've, we've covered um, quite a lot of ground, but I did uh, warn her, the audience, I, I was uh, keen to, to, to throw uh, the floor open to you to have an opportunity for your thoughts. However, I did put uh, a question to um, our, our panel, and I gave them you know, some time to actually think about it because it was a, a quite a hard left, left field question which was to be um, uh, if they had a magic wand and any uh, unlimited authority, power, resource, you know, what would be the thing that they would change in order uh, in relation to, to, to structure and quality of life? Now, Bill's looking worried because I didn't ask Bill, so I'm not expecting him to, <laughs> to, to answer, but I certainly put it to, to, to uh, the rest of our panel. So if I might invite their, uh, their thoughts on that, and if, Bill, you have anything to say, that would be great as well. David? 
Um, well, um, one could say a number of things. I, I would confine myself to saying that government should do um, less uh, in the way of producing policy. I think we've got a surfeit of policy. I think what we need is a commitment to effective implementation and getting it right on the ground and getting the ground, the, the, the periphery, the people locally, as part of that uh, dialogue and discourse so that things aren't done to them, but done with them collectively. And the NHS has been very slow to learn. It's been a very top-down command and control structure. And I think the current chief executive is, is trying to change that, but it's um, a, long, a long haul. But I think that, for me, would be the key thing. Government's doing less in terms of spewing out policy and being much more rigorous about implementing what they've got with the people who ostensibly should be co-designing that policy and therefore have some buy-in and commitment to it instead of what we have, which is a, a workforce that's often cynical, uh, disenchanted, disconnected, believes that governments come and go, whatever fad and fashion there is today, it'll be replaced tomorrow, uh, and we needn't worry about our quality of life. We just The best way of coping with that is just to ignore what's coming down upon us from on high. So we need to change that culture and that way of working. And that, to me, doesn't involve money. It involves a different way of um, governing the system. Kimberly. Um, if I had a wand, I would uh, give everyone someone to have dinner with. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so, so the Jenny Stevens article, she, she said not only that if you eat alone all the time, you are much lower in terms of your sense of happiness than the national average, but if you eat regularly with other people, you, 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 you do positively feel good about yourself and your value. So you know, we can maybe have an app. You know, Uber connects, connects people who want to share a ride. Um, we can have an app that you, know, you could find someone within walking distance who was, wanted to meet up for dinner, or was hosting dinner. Brent. I was going to say, but I, I agree, you've taken some of my issue about working with, that's a, that's a, that's a crucial issue in particularly. Uh, for disability studies, and I've already mentioned the idea of little acts of generosity. I, I think we should be uh, be more considerate of. Uh, but if I those would be if I had a magic wand. But if I had a magic wand and I was going to let my imagination drift uh, even further to a place that I know could never be envisaged, uh, not for a long time, I would ask for every company who's earning millions and millions of pounds just to put it into the government and to the government to give it to the communities to work with. Mm. You know, it made me so upset that Marks and Spencers were closing mm. 100, what was it, 100 stores yeah. for the rationale that its profits are not high enough, yeah. 500 odd million. It, it, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Uh, people's quality of life will be destroyed yeah. because of that for the pound sign. Uh, that's a magic wand. <laughs> and I'm not a Marxist at heart. Uh, what, would you... Well, I think I, I already said that I'd like to see Donald Trump Jr. imprisoned. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yet? if I have to be more serious about it, I think... I mean, one of the, the things that I think that, that is, is, is really emblematic of this country, and it certainly was overwhelmingly so when I first came here in the early 1970s, was was this, something the British really prided themselves on, was this idea of being considerate of others and doing the right thing doing. and, you know, just a, a, a general sense of decency. And I think, overwhelmingly, that is still the case here. I, I, it's, 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 I don't know what proportion of people, but, you know, well over 90% of people still are decent and do the right thing and don't put banana peels down on benches and don't take two spaces when they park and do all those other things that are so irritating. <laughs> and so if I, if I could do, wave a, a wand, I would, you know, I would just somehow coax the minority back so that, we could, so that it would be like wonderful everywhere. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't have these you know, in, occasional infuriating moments in my day when I, you know, when I have to deal with the banana skin, which by the way, I got rid of. Um, today, which I really hated. I, um, I have washed my hands since, but I just couldn't leave it there. Um, so, you know, those kind of things that are really exasperating and infuriating, I just wish somehow we could eliminate them. They've definitely uh, offered us provocative things um, to, to do with a, a, a metaphorical uh, magic wand. But before we uh, uh, draw to a conclusion today, I hope you'll uh, join me in thanking uh, the panel for their time and for their reflections. <laughs>